Good afternoon, I'm Heather Parra, Exhibits and Collections Manager at Victoria College's Museum of the Coastal Bend. Thank you all for joining us today, both in person and virtually. With us today is Greg Garrett. He is a museum educator and will be talking to us about corn. Much of what we do is supported by members of the museum. Please consider becoming a member if you aren't one already. Greetings, hello everybody out there in history land. My name is Greg Garrett. I'm here to have a little talk with you today about corn. Corn. Seems simple. What are we going to talk about? Popcorn? Corn on the cob? What are we going to talk about? Nah, let's talk about the history of corn. Let's talk about how important it's been to the indigenous of both of South America, Mesoamerica, and North America. Let's talk about how it was grown. Let's talk about how it was processed. Let's talk about where it was processed and the tools that were used. Let's talk about how it was used to help merge cultures together and create brand new cultures. So I don't think it's going to be a very boring conversation today. I think it's going to be a lot funner than just corn on the cob and popcorn. So why don't we get started? Now, we have a table full of different objects here right now. And I want you to know that around the world, indigenous cultures in some form or fashion have been using mortar or grindstones and pestles for thousands and thousands of years, as long as there's begun to be agrarian lifestyles or farming lifestyles. I wanted to go through a couple of examples of some of the types of mortar and pestles you might find throughout history and different parts of the world before we get to the tool that we're going to focus on today. The first one I'd like to start with is your classic mortar and pestle. Right? This is made out of marble. So this might have been something that you found in, I don't know, 1300, 1400 Europe, maybe an alchemist or a, a chemist of some sort or a physician of some sort would have used this to grind up tinctures or make medicines. The second one I'd really like to show you today, and this one's really cool because this is more of a worldwide tool. I've seen uh, types of this used in Asia. I've seen types of this used in Africa. Um, Dr. Para has let me know that in her studies, she's seen this tool used in our Eastern European countries. And even closer to home, the Cattoan nation would have been using this in our big thicket because Cattoans have a resource all around them in the big thicket, wood. So what we've got is actually an oak stump. All right, this might be a cypress stump, whatever type of tree is around and provides a large enough base for them to be able to begin to hollow it out. Now, the process they would have used to hollow this thing out would have been a burning process, similar to the way that the Karankawa would have burned out a canoe. Okay, so they would have started coals inside this thing, burned it out, and hollowed it out deep enough to where they could then take their pestle and begin to grind it. Now, this one's a bit unfinished. It's a work in progress, but it's a good example of what they would have been using. So this is a large pestle that would have been hand carved, and the actual mortar would have been handmade out of wood. Now, as Anglo uh, settlers began to move into Texas, they would have actually used tools like adz and things like that to carve out these hollow spots in these stumps. And they actually would have renamed it too. This would have been known as a homie block among Anglo settlers in Texas during the 1800s as they were moving in and beginning their farming communities. Now, the third one I'd like to show you is a very close relative to what we're going to focus on today. The third one is called a mocajete. All right, this mocajete would have been used for smaller grinding jobs, maybe seeds, things like that. But most often it would have been used to make salsas, maybe put some onions, some tomatoes, some cilantro, some peppers that are grown in the garden in here. And you're going to use your little pestle here to grind it all up, or maybe some aguacate, some avocado to make a little guacamole. Okay, so these are things that would have been used to help grind up different types of food sources. Now, the one that we're going to concentrate today on today is the mano y metate. All right? Now, the mano y metate has been used for thousands of years throughout the American Southwest and the regions of Texas. We can date it back to the prehistoric period, which I believe, Dr. Parr, goes back to about 14,000 AD, right? Something about that? Pretty close? She's the pro on that. So we've got... Proof of use among the Mogollon in far west Texas, Navajo, Pueblo, and as I mentioned, the cattle were using a form of a mortar and pestle. 
And even the indigenous that might have been living in the earlier missions in East Texas during the 1600s, they might have been using a form of this with inside the mission. Okay? Now, the mono and the metate became really important as you begin to see agrarian lifestyles replace the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. As you begin to see people less dependent on hunting down their food and more dependent on growing it and becoming sedentary. All right, so you begin to see small farming communities of indigenous people begin to pop up. This is what the Mogollon had back, I believe, 3000 AD, somewhere in there. Um, we've even found proof here in Victoria County. We've got an artifact right here on display, the Museum of the Coastal Bend, that was found that dates back to the Archaic period, which I believe could be as far back as 4000 AD, about then. So these mono imitates have been in use in Texas for a very long time. Now, as these agrarian lifestyles began to build up, corn became an essential part of the diet throughout all of the Americas. Okay? Texas was no exception. Indigenous in Texas grew corn and it became an essential part of the diet. But corn didn't give its nutrients up quite that easy. It's a little booger when you're trying to grind it down because of that hard shell, okay? That hard shell, if we just pop that fresh-shelled piece of corn into our mouth, try to swallow it and get the nutrients out of it, our bellies are not going to digest that. Our digestive system cannot break down the shell that is around that corn. That is why the only way that we get those nutrients out of that kernel of corn is by grinding. That is why the mono and the matate became such important tools to the indigenous people of the American Southwest. Now, this metate here is made out of a volcanic rock called basalt, and it is excellent for grinding corn. The reason it's so good for grinding corn is it's porous, it's also got a very rough surface, so it really helps to break down that hard kernel or that hard shell that's on each kernel of corn. Now, the artifact that we have here seems to be a smoother piece of limestone, and you also seem to, you also saw matates made out of sandstone. The reason that you would use a matate with a smoother surface is because at times you might have been grinding up things like pine nuts or seeds that would produce a resin or would become sticky as you ground them. If you were to do that on a basalt corn grinding matate, it would ruin your matate. It would get all down in the holes, it would get all sticky, you wouldn't be able to grind corn on it. So the smoother surfaces would have been used to grind things like that. The basalt surfaces would have been used to grind corn. Now, the thing about these basalt matates, they lasted for generations. So this would have been something that was generational. This would have been something that would have been passed down from abuelita to, to, their, to their daughters, to their granddaughters, you know, from grandma to, to daughter to granddaughter, you know. So, these were prized family possessions and a very important part of the culture once corn became so important. Now, even though we've got this rough surface that you see here on this basalt matate, we still needed to give a little boost to that corn so that it was a little easier for us to process. It was a little easier for the indigenous to process. There's a chemical process out there that's called nixtamalization. Big word, big crazy sounding word. The root word of that is nixtamal. Nixtamal actually, if I'm not mistaken, is a Mesoamerican word that literally means corn boiled in lime water. So the nixtamalization process would have been taking your fresh shelled corn and boiling it in lime water. Boiling it in lime water, he's saying. What are we going to do? We're going to fill up a pot full of water and squeeze a bunch of limes into it? Throw our corn in there? We're going to boil it in lime water? Not quite that easy, okay? The process today can be done by just going down to Home Depot, by going down to Lowe's, True Value, and buying a bag of cow. This is basically a non-toxic form of lime. You put that lime into some boiling water, let that lime dissolve in there, and that gives you your lime water. Then dump your corn in, let it boil for a while, it's gonna break down that shell. Now, obviously, the indigenous of Texas couldn't go to Home Depot. They couldn't go to Lowe's, they couldn't go to True Value. So they had a process of their own that they developed where they would use limestone rocks. 
and they would stone boil. Okay, so basically what they would do is they'd take these limestone rocks, they'd build a fire, you'd place the rocks into the fire, let them heat up. You'd take the hot rocks and you would place them into whatever type of vessel you had to hold your water. It may have been something carved out like this hominy block that was used just to hold water. It may have been the stomach of a bison, you know, something like that. So anything that would have held water that you would have been able to put those rocks into that were hot, you would slowly replace the rocks, heat them up, put them back in the water. Heat them up, put them back until you had boiling water going. And once you had your boiling water going, that limestone would break down, and that's natural lime, the same lime you're getting from cow. So that natural lime that's in the limestone would have been used to create the nixtamalization process for the indigenous. That's their lime water. That breaks down the shell that's on that pesky kernel of corn. So now, we've got our nixtamal. The next step is going to be taking your nixtamal, and it's time to use our mono and our metate. Now, mano in Spanish means hand. So basically, you've got a two-handed grindstone here. Metate, a rough translation, flat grindstone. So you've got a two-handed grinder, you've got a flat grindstone, two of the most important tools that the indigenous Texans would have used right here, especially once we began to move towards an agrarian society and a farming community. So you take your hands, two hands like this on your mono, you put your nixtamal down here, and then you slowly begin the process of breaking it down. Now, that nixtamal, you need to remember, is going to be somewhat damp. It's going to be a bit wet because you've just put it through the nixtamalization process. What we've got here is corn that has been put through that process, but it's dried. So this is going to be a little bit of a tougher grind. So this is going to take a little bit longer. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to do it. It just means it's going to take a little longer. If you were grinding this and you had your nixtamal mixture here, basically what you would end up with as you ground is you would end up with a mixture that was about the consistency of wet sand. Okay? And to that nixtamal mixture, you would slowly add water until you got a stiff dough. So the process of grinding, it would have been a it wouldn't have been just a straight thing because you're going to push all your corn straight off of your matate. So you had to kind of get into it and use the corners of your mono. All right? And you can begin to see we're starting to grind it down on top of this basalt. So as we get this done and we grind it down and our nixtamal mixture is sitting in our dish below our matate, we would then take our nixtamal mixture, mix it with a little water till we had a good stiff dough, that's our masa dough. Same thing you go to H-E-B and buy in a bag some masa flour. That's exactly what you had right there, okay? So once we have our masa dough, then that's when you're really gonna be able to make the food products that were important to their communities. And I'm gonna get into a few of those towards the end. <laughs> Save it as a little bit of a surprise. Now, Luckily, I'm standing right here in front of our Spanish area. And as European colonization began to happen into Texas, mainly through Spanish contact, we begin to see two cultures develop alongside each other. And we begin to see an integration and a merging of these two cultures, of an indigenous culture and of a Spanish bloodline culture. Okay. This, this merging created a brand new mestizo culture or a mixed blood culture. And this began, became very prevalent as Aguayo went back and began to reestablish the mission system starting in East Texas and working his way down through the Coastal Bend region. Once he began to, to reestablish the missions and the presidios and whether integration was forced or voluntary, we can't always be sure, but integration began to happen within those presidios and within those missions. Now, this was 1720s right in there that you began to see the reestablishment of the mission system. Another important aspect of this, this blending of two cultures happened as the ranching communities began to be built down in South Texas with the introduction of Nuevo Santander, Jose de Escandón, and Manuel Escandón, his son. 
They begin to build from Rio Grande up ranching communities and be begin to create a ranching industry for Spain. With this ranching industry, any industry is going to create communities. You know, farming industry is going to create a farming community, which we kind of saw in the indigenous. So between what was happening in the missions and the presidios and what was happening from the Rio Grande working itself up through the coastal bend region with ranching, we really begin to see these two separate indigenous and Spanish cultures begin to really mix, begin to really merge together, begin to create this mist, new mestizo culture that we now know as Tejano. Now, not only were they sharing bloodlines, but as these cultures merged, they were also sharing beliefs, traditions, practices, technologies, tools, foods, music, art, all of the things that cultures do when they're introduced to each other. Sure, there's negative aspects. There's always going to be negative aspects of introductions of new cultures to each other, but there's always going to be positive aspects too. We'd really like to dwell on the positive here at Coastal, the Museum of the Coastal Bend. So as you begin to see these communities merge and you begin to see these new traditions blended together and separate traditions blended together and make new traditions and the rise of this brand new Tejano culture in Texas, you begin to understand how important corn was to the community, how important a simple stone tool was to the community. Corn meant survival, it meant life, it meant sustenance. So learning how to process that corn in your natural environment, in your natural surroundings, was something that the Spanish were going to have to do. And the only people there to learn it from were the indigenous. So when we talk about corn and the matate being a bridge, it was one of many, but stone tools and food and sustenance were, were a bridge between the Tejano cult, I mean the, the indigenous culture and the Spanish culture that lives today, okay? I'm sure there's plenty of you out there that have an abuelita, grandma, a tia, an aunt, you know, an hermana, a sister somewhere. When you go into their kitchens, you see one of these things sitting on the counter. You know, and they may still use it in a traditional manner, okay? They may still use it to do a traditional grinding method and, and create nixtamo and, and create masa in this traditional indigenous way. But more than likely, if they're not using it, there's a reason that it's sitting there also. And that's because of the symbolization. Okay? It's a symbol of the past. It's a symbol of two great cultures coming together and, and merging themselves to create this whole brand new culture that we're, we're going to teach about here at the Museum of the Coastal Bend that we're proud to call Texan and that's Los Teanos. So as you're rolling into your Thanksgiving holidays and you're rolling into the holiday season and you know, you, all of a sudden you start seeing the tamales coming along and we got plates of enchiladas and corn tortillas are getting stacked up. Well, those are all products that were made on this Manu Imitate right here 2,000, 3,000 years ago. You know, masa dough was being used to pack and make tamales. We were, had corn tortillas that were being cooked on comales over open flames. So it's not a far stretch to say that when you see one of these, that there's still a very deep connection among the contemporary Tejano culture and an understanding of where they came from and what it took to create this new Tejano culture that we've had the privilege to watch grow and develop. A brand new culture. You don't get that very often, you know, not from the beginning. And, and to have that opportunity here in Texas to watch that culture and, and see how important it has become to our state and it has become to the people of our state and how much it has added to what defines Texas, you know, makes me proud to stand up here today and talk about these things. So I'm going to finish up and I uh, really want y'all to enjoy your Thanksgiving, enjoy your, your Christmas time all of the holidays that are going to be coming up. And remember, when you see that corn dish or you see those tamales 
Just stop and take a minute. Or you see that mono and matate sitting in your abuelita's kitchen. Just stop and take a minute and think about what that stone tool meant, not only to the past, but to the present and to the future of the Tejano community. Thank you all very much for coming today and sitting with us. I really appreciate it, and I hope, beyond all hopes, that I get to do this much more often. Dr. Pata? Uh, Greg, we've got some questions. Coming. Excellent. Let's try to answer them. How would the uh, early uh, Indian population cook their masa versus the uh, Spanish? Well, the early indigenous would have probably been using flat stones, you know, things like that. The comales would have come along at some point once they started to develop. And the comales are the red clay, shallow pots or plates that would have been placed on open flames. So comales would have come along pretty, I would say, I don't want to start speaking beyond my knowledge. But uh, comales were important to the Spanish culture. And I would have to just, I would be guessing, but I would feel like it's a safe guess that much earlier indigenous cultures were probably using some sort of flat stones to do that with. Um, you know, any type of hot service is going to cook masa or corn dough. You know, I've slaves took hoes out into the field and cooked their hoe cakes during their little breaks and little flames on their hoes that they were using to cut their plants. So any kind of hot flat surface that you could get would have been probably what would have been used. My guess for indigenous would have been flat rocks, things like that. And as the Spanish influence began to move in, you would have seen the comales begin to develop and things along those nature. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, go ahead. Is, is that the same process that used for making bricks? Or... I, I, I would have to guess. Any, any, anytime you're working with corn, you're going to have to do this nixtamalization process. You're going to have to break it down to where you can use it. You know, um, we all know kind of what happens when you eat a corn on a cob. So grits would have been the same as maybe making Johnny Cakes or something like that. It's just a different form. So that would have been post nixtamalization You would have gone through this process already before you started making your grits. I figured uh, new ones are being made or have been made, but how I think that probably would be more of a question for Dr. Pada because she's a little more into the archaeology thing. And I haven't done the work to actually trace the bloodline of how far back. But I mean, I've seen artifacts found at different dig sites in Texas that, like I said, date back you know, up to 14,000 years at some of the earliest, like Clovis sites and stuff, they found artifacts for these mono and metates. So it, it's tough to say, you know, I mean, as, as, as long as there's been a reason to grind the corn, I'm sure somebody has picked up a stone and a rock and, and done the grinding process. And then it sort of evolved into Different types of metates, you know, like I pointed out, where there's smooth surface ones for different types of, of food products, and there's some that are better for corn. There's others that have lips that, that would actually be a trough metate. So a lot of different styles, but it, I mean, stone tools, you know, tracing that so far, you can trace stone tools back a long way. Well, if you're looking at a climatic difference, I know that um, in, in ancient times in Russia, even they used a kind of mortar and pestle. So this is actually a universal tool. And different sizes, different shapes, but the same concept. How many matates would be used in a Pueblo, or would it be one group in the Pueblo doing the driving, another group doing the farming? Right. What's that? How many matates might have been in a community and being used at once? Uh, I would think that, I know from past employers and certain murals and research we've done, um, small farming communities like Mogollon, there would have been people that were going out to the field and doing the work. There was still some light hunting going on with nets and throw sticks and things like that. Um, but there was also uh, designated job duties, I guess. And a lot of it would have been based on sex, based on feminine and masculine duties and, you know, the more of the household type stuff would have been food preparation, 
um, child care, that type of thing, would have been more along the uh, responsibility of the females of the community. That's not to say males wouldn't have been grinding up corn when necessary, but as far as divisions of labor, that probably would have been left to the female side of the community. Uh, I also know that they probably would have been doing a lot of building of the ovens and things like that too, from what I could tell in our murals and some of the research that we had done at my last employer. So it's hard to tell how many metates would have actually been in a community, but I would feel safe in saying that the female aspect of the community probably would have done the majority of the labor on a metate. Did that kind of answer what you were looking for? Would it be, have been used on, on crushing snail or getting, getting the moisture out of the snail? Out of, the, out of snails? Um, but yeah, I mean, you could crush anything you want. I've never actually heard of anybody using a matate to crush snails, so that's a new one on me. Uh, but I've seen people using mortars and pestles to make gunpowder and different things like that. So anything that you needed to grind up, you probably would have been. And, and as with the basalt, you might have had a little, it might have soaked up some of the moisture into this basalt rock. Um, the sandstone definitely probably would have soaked in some moisture. I would have to believe, and I would imagine limestone would have even taken in a little bit of moisture. So, it, you know, just logically, you would think that grinding on sandstone would remove some of the moisture if you're grinding up crabs or snails or something that has a hard shell that you're trying to get to the meat of, yeah. Yes, sir? Is that material abundant? I mean, would they just carve it out? Well, the basalt, the basalt, a lot of the basalt, from what I understand, Came, came from Mesoamerica. Um, we don't have a lot of basalt rock in North America, do we? Am, am I safe in saying that? There's not a lot of spots with basalt. Yeah, it's, from what I understand, most of the basalt that I've done research on is, like I said, it's generational, so a lot of it may have traveled with families north. That's one piece that carved it out? Yes, this is all one piece. The legs, it's all carved out of one piece of stone. The legs and everything, it's all unified one piece of stone. So not only does it become a utilitarian tool, but there's a certain amount of artistic, you know, skill put into creating this thing, artisan type stuff, you know. Could lava rock be used into a stone? I would imagine any type of stone, any type of hard stone, um, it, stones can be used for grinding. I mean, if we could use sandstone, as soft as sandstone is, I'd, I would believe that you could pretty much use any type of stone.